Hi everyone, uh, my name is Henry Boyd. I'm one of the uh, founding photographers of uh, Mass Collective. Uh, I run the collective with Francesco Russo and Luca Pifferetti. Um, today we're going to be doing our discussion uh, with Steve McLeod and uh, Jacqueline Jubert and uh, Joe uh, Robson, um, who will be our panel members. They are representing, Steve's representing uh, Metro Imaging as the director and uh, Joe and Jackie are the directors of an East Gallery. Um, we're really happy that you could all come today. We're really thankful um, to everyone that made donations to the collective. Um, it supports us to do events like this. So um, thank you very much. It's very, very kind of you. Um, today, our topic is all about photography on the wall, um, exhibiting, printing, um, your work as a photographer and also the, the physical versus the virtual space. Um, the collective that we, we run um, is all about uh, documenting the built environment. Um, we run events like these, which have been physical in the past, but sadly due to COVID are now all online, but that's kind of advantages that we can see everyone from all over the world here at one time, which is quite nice. Um, we run socials, uh, we have future exhibitions that we're going to run and collective projects um, as a collective. And we're always looking um, for emerging talent um, from any photographer who works in the built environment. Um, our panel today, uh, we have Metro Imaging, we have Steve here, um, and he is the director of one of the lead, uh, Europe's leading image companies offering a comprehensive solution for fine art photographic uh, exhibitions. And we also have Joan Jackie, who are from a Nice gallery, and they're a contemporary art gallery with a strong focus towards the architectural aesthetic. Um, today, the event is recorded so that you know. Um, we are, are going to put this up live, um, afterwards on YouTube. Um, just so that you know, and uh, the event should run for about an hour uh, to an hour and a half. Uh, we'll have 45 minute discussion with Steve, Joe and Jackie. And then after that, uh, we'll have a 15 minute Q&A. So if you have any good questions that you'd really like to ask the panel members or ourselves at Mass Collective, we'll be very happy to answer those. Um, uh, Francesco will be taking care of the chat, so if you need to ask him anything or want to give a shout out, then please do. Um, and yeah, so hi everyone, and hi Steve, and hi Joe and Jackie. I just, before you, before you kick yeah. off, I just wanted to say hi to everyone and to say that I'll do my best to collect all the questions, as Henry said. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so feel free to write either to the public chat or privately to me, I'll... I'll I'll do my best and at the end of the conversation we'll we'll try to answer all you have to uh, all you need to know so yeah I'll leave it to you guys great does um does Steve Steve do you want to introduce yourself a bit say a little bit about yourself yeah sure hi everybody uh, thank you Mass uh, Collective and uh, Anise Gallery uh, for inviting me to talk this evening uh, I'm coming from my outside Colchester to what was my dining room and since Covid has been my office um, I think my, our, my world has become very virtual and less uh, physical in terms of being in and out of the lab every day, but I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I realize there's a lot of in-depth, uh, you know, conversation this evening. And what I would say is if you know, there's anything clear, not clear or you'd like further information, please do get in touch. Um, we have a very sort of open book policy in terms of, you know, what we do at the lab. We're not just sort of processing things and, and making products for our clients. We're also quite active as a hub uh, in terms of a, a learning resource. So, you know, if anything, you want more information, et cetera, then please, please do contact me um, either through Mass Collective or directly uh, through uh, Metro Imaging. But delighted to be here. And, and once again, thanks for inviting me. Cheers, Steve. And yeah, Joe and Jackie, do you want to say a little, little word before we get, get started on the questions? Yeah, sure. Well, um, thank you very much for inviting us to be a part of the talk. Um, we're very happy to be here chatting to you all today. Um, we just as a little bit of background on the Nice Gallery, we set that up um, coming up to 10 years ago. It was 2012 that we started and had our first um, shows. And we were based, we are based, well, 
have been based in Chad Thames uh, for eight of those years. And um, when we set up the gallery, we were really keen to sort of find a, a specific uh, niche or area that we could look into and exhibit work from. And we, we went for, um, our background was in architecture. So we, we chose to focus on, on the architectural side of artwork, which wasn't really, really very, it, not many people were doing it at the time. We, mm. we So it felt like a, a, a nice little area that we could really tap into and do, and bring something different to people. And that's that's sort of what we've enjoyed doing for, for those eight or nine years is um, uh, celebrating and enjoying artwork that relates back to architecture or the built environment and um, the world around us, really, the, the, the built world around us. And um, that has led us to a lot of photography, meeting a lot of architectural photographers, exhibiting a lot of architectural photography, which has, has really been a, a, a sort of highlight of um, those years running the gallery. Um, more recently, we just before lockdown, we had decided to move on from Shad Thames. Uh, the gallery is in a slight uh, sort of state of flux at the moment. We have two mm -hmm. venues, two new venues that we are proposing to start exhibiting at. One is uh, where we are now, um, which is in Forest Hill, and the other one is going to be in Greenwich. Um, but it was a case of uh, much like what this talk is about that we did find over the years that the people actually visiting did start to dwindle a bit. And we realized that we had to sort of change the, the format of the gallery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and start doing different things and start bringing different things to people. So that's what we're embarking on now. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, time. And I think for everyone, we're all in this sort of uh, state of flux at the moment where as photographers from the collective, we, we uh, uh, our job is very physical yet we're now in a totally uh, virtual world. So it's, um, it's a, a difficult time and it may change in a couple of months, but I think that these, uh, what's happened in COVID recently um, could definitely be uh, be influential into how we all work in the future in some way or another. So yeah, I think it's interesting that you guys are looking at that and, and how that might change in the future. Um, I suppose that brings us on then to our first question, uh, which is uh, how is the virtual space changing the exhibition? Um, and is the physical exhibition still relevant in the digital age? And I think that's a perfect introdu introduction to that, uh, Jackie. So maybe you guys want to want to kick us off with some of your ideas and exhibitions and examples of some of the work that you guys have put together. Okay. Yeah. Well. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Joe. Uh, well, we, we hope that the um, the physical gallery is always going to stay relevant, and uh, I think throughout the course of this talk, um, I'm hoping that we we can reassure everyone that that's going to be the case. Um, and I think the, uh, a lot of the reasons behind that are, are purely to do with, uh, I guess, the process um, of visiting galleries, uh, the process of exhibiting, uh, and actually the, the, the kind of being there in person side of things, which um, is not only to do with just how you appreciate the artwork, but everything else that goes alongside it. Um, so we can take you through a couple of our exhibitions, um, but I don't know whether, Steve, do you want to say anything more from the kind of... Um, the yeah, I think, I think I'd, I'd echo that, uh, Joe, in terms of, you know, reassuring people about the physicality of uh, looking at uh, photography and, and, and vision uh, imagery in general. I think what we're seeing within our, you know, role as production organisation in our 42 years uh, that we've been going, that um, we've we've sort of gone through different transitions from analog to digital and back again, um, and we're we're you know embracing different forms of of production, including augmented reality, virtual reality, and we're actually looking at the moment of a, a new sort of technology um, called Wave. Um, there's a Wave technology, 
um, where you know it's touchless screens, etc. And I think that's been forced through a lot by the pandemic as well. This idea of like the physicality of actually touching things. So technology is sort of running in parallel with the the analog. There's a resurgence in very much about craft and process, but at the same time, the, the way that technology is really going on leaps and bounds through augmented reality, virtual reality, and wave technology. And I'm not sure if anybody sort of experienced the Ed Bertensky exhibition at Photo London uh, a few years ago. Can I just screen share and I'll quickly pull up yeah, that, that image? Um, yeah, definitely, Steve, go for it. And, yeah, uh, and so it's a, I'll sort of, I've got various sort of slides here, but I'll, I'll flip on to the Ed Bertensky one. Um, and I'll go sort of... Um, so... This was an exhibition that Ed Bertinsky did as part of a collaboration at Photo London, where you could actually view the physical prints that framed on the wall, but at the same time, download an app or a QR code to access video content or audio content in support of the exhibition. So this is a few years old now, I think two or three years old, but you can see this early dawn of um, the use of augmented reality in on site uh, is something that was really is being pioneered and and we're sort of moving away from the tablet orientation into something we were actually like almost like a we're building worlds and building environments with, on and off screen so that's a that's a sort of a snapshot of some you know both i think levels and the parallels in technology being used with this sort of physical space and 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 framed art on the wall coming together with um cutting edge technology and the way that you experience it. So it, it's, it's all kind of um, contributes to that sort of overall sort of feel. So we, we're seeing, a, you know, it's not like labs like ours are going to be dead in the water. I think there's, there's um, uh, life through the sort of, I, I think, um, productive uh, production circuits evolves over time and we learn to adapt and we, we sort of, um, you know, it cycles round again and again and again. It's just a little yeah. bit, a bit different every time. Exactly, and I think it's it's to do with recognizing and embracing new technologies that are around and being aware of them, and then using them to your own advantage and and um, and the opportunities that they do then offer you to uh, to add to an exhibition. Um, I just if if I can just share a couple of things as well. Absolutely, please do. Uh, yeah. Right, let me just have a look at this. Uh, Right, so this should be, um, right, hopefully that's coming through all right. Uh, this yeah. is an exhibition that we, well, it's not an exhibition, it's part of the London Art Fair that we did in 2018. And um, it's it obviously, um, you've probably all been to art fairs, but there you give this little tiny booth um, that's rather expensive, but uh, all the same, it's pretty small. Um, and we wanted to make the most of that. So we, we had, uh, three or four um, uh, uh, artists that we were showing there. Um, and we wanted to bring something slightly different to the visitors to the, uh, to the exhibition, to the, um, to the art fair. And what we did is we put in a, uh, if I could go to the next slide. Um, oops. Uh, oops well, not, that. not that. Uh, <laughs> hold on, there's my arrow. Yeah. So we had um, a VR setup, which, uh, the artwork on the walls, obviously physical, um, so uh, visitors to the stand could walk around, have a look at the artwork on the walls, and then put on a headset, which um, when you put in the headset, it takes you inside a virtual gallery, which we really played with scale here, uh, and from the confines of a sort of six metre by four metre booth, we um, we took it back to a five-storey um virtual reality gallery that had uh, that housed the artwork at massive scale but it was, it was the show. same the same artwork that was on the stand so it was sort exactly. of um instead of a get of a catalogue of artists the, the catalogue was virtual so you could be introduced to these artists and their artwork in the virtual and and the virtual does offer a, a a different perspective you know we actually took people through the artwork we actually took them into the artwork and we and they could explore it from a huge a much yeah. different angle to to what they could on the stand but they all appreciated taking the headset off and then going back to look at the artwork again in real life and i think that was the it, it yeah. really worked as a complementary 
piece um, mm. to enhance the visitor's experience of the yeah. artwork rather than a standalone, this is instead of. It, exactly, I think that's a key word. It's this, um, they, they work together, they work in partnership. And we find that as well in print, you know, we, technology has come on leaps and bounds, even in, in the, the realms of what print has, is doing. And often we feel that, you know, it's got to, they have, you know, whatever process you're investigating, it has to be complementary to your vision and your, your creativity. So it's a very good key word, I think, is that they complement one another. Because we still, we still yeah. want people to come to the gallery, but yeah, we want exactly, to yeah. give them the best possible yeah. experience. Yeah, and I think the first time we ever did that was um, in 20, I think 2016, we did an exhibition um, with one of our screen print artists. And the, uh, what we wanted to demonstrate is the fact that all the multiple layers of, of her screen print is so, um, so delicate, but, but essentially it's a two-dimensional two image that she's creating. But we, we, we constructed a three-dimensional space which took you through her process of the screen print and also mm -hmm. into the image itself. So um, there was, it was a very beautiful exhibition. I think people um, uh, were quite taken aback by, the, by, by that kind of augmentation, not, not mm -hmm. a traditional augmented reality, but uh, augmenting an additional um, level of absorption into artwork. Yeah, I mean, it's almost as if with that, uh, the virtual reality there, the platform, it almost become a piece of art in itself. And that, and that, and the actual uh, physicality of the gallery, um, though in a virtual space, had had sort of been represented and depicted in that in that image. So I think that's a really interesting way of of uh, rehashing, uh, I suppose, um, the gallery in a, in a way you can reuse and, and, and still appreciate the artwork in person, but then take it into a totally new environment and explore it there. Um, and I think that is a really lovely way of combining both uh, the modern technology that we, we can now use with, as Steve showed in, at the Edward Patinksy thing to, to experience the artwork in a, in a second way, in a second form. And, and those combinations of virtual and physical are a very nice example of, of how we can bring those both together. I think you have to be careful as well, though, because I, mm. I, I, I really, you know, and, and everybody's sort of experience of these things varies. And, you know, and in my, my own experience of, of utilizing both technologies is sometimes I see and view the VR headset or, or even an earphone, if I'm going around a museum or a gallery and I've got somebody telling me what's on the wall, it kind of switches me off a bit and I just don't want to know because I want to find out for myself or I want to enjoy it. So I, I found that with the Ed Bertensky show, I actually, I found that the tablet sort of scenario became an obstruction because you're kind of looking at the screen and then looking at the art. And, and one of the, somebody attending, I think it's Richard has said about this idea of scale. Often when you look in a physical exhibition, what drags you in and what intrigues you is often the scale. And it's not always huge, big mural size images on the wall. It's often maybe the small intimate artworks that draw you in and engage with you over an extended period of time. And so I think you have to be very careful that they do complement each other and they're there for a substantial reason rather than just because we can, you know, because it's very much like that Photoshop adage, you know, just because they've got all the tools in the box doesn't mean you need to use them. Um, I do think it's a sort of, uh, a, a sort of duty of care actually to sort of to respond to the technology in an appropriate way so that they do complement each other and they're there in a, not just as a supporting role but they're there mm -hmm. in a justifiable role in itself. They're really considered as a, mm -hmm. a as part of the artwork rather than a secondary thought yeah. process, like a, a kind of gimmick almost um, mm -hmm. it, it's more than that it's thought thought through more than that and um, I suppose I'd quickly like to share an example that we did with mass um, I'll just do this on here um, and this was the uh, mass virtual gallery um, that we exhibited last year at the LFA in 2020 um, and this was us in, in this as last year when we were stuck um, with, uh, with the lockdown restrictions and COVID and having a physical space wasn't um, we weren't able to at the time. So instead we created, um, four, it ran for a whole month. We ran four exhibitions with one week long each uh, where two artists could exhibit their work. 
um, in a virtual world. Um, the nice thing about this was that you were able to have avatars um, that would allow us to sort of interact with one another as if you were almost in a public space. Um, the, uh, if I take this down a bit, here we go. Here's one of the talks that we did. We were also able to share our, our sort of videos, uh, video links uh, and talk sort of in person. So though we weren't able to come together, it was a nice uh, example of, uh, of, of being able to have a sort of uh, social space for mass. So yeah, that was um, it was an interesting experiment that we tried to do. Um, though I do not envy running a gallery itself, it is a very difficult thing to do. We thought it would be very simple, um, and uh, for some reason, yeah, totally overlooked that. So don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Thank you, Henry. I think what what you did create, though. I mean, we I, we popped into that what, um, at least one of the uh, exhibitions you had, and I think what you'd managed to create was something which um uh was was sort of lacking uh in a lot of these online things because um a lot of virtual virtual galleries um th that you see online now are essentially white boxes which you can just walk around and then the artwork is placed on the wall and they i think what you what you what you brought onto yours was the fact that having people in the space and the avatars walking around and obviously you know we're restricted by what we can do but I think that uh, that brought part of um, the, the the actual being there as close as we can um, to to actually being being at an event or being. You, at an you did night. feel like you wanted to to show your face and be there. Yeah, so yeah. it was funny. It yeah. Was, yeah, it was it was nice social element I think, and it was important to still show your face because the avatars have that anonymity, uh, and it's not a very in a way, it's a bit sort of weird having, because when you arrive, you were given a false name and a false avatar that doesn't really represent you. So being able to share that video link and having that actual face-to-face -face, uh, time to talk to someone about the work, I think is still a very important part of the physical space. And I'm glad that we could incorporate that into the virtual one. Um, I'll just quickly share one other example before we get back to uh, uh, Steve and Jackie and Joe, and this was uh, by Phone Magazine, and something that I thought was a very innovative way of using um, a website uh, to kind of have a exhibition and gallery space. Um, they're probably under similar situation that most of these artists couldn't actually exhibit in a physical gallery, and I love that it almost mimics a contact sheet um, of uh, a sort of, yeah, a bunch of negatives, and so it's almost uh, combining this feeling of um, the virtual and the physical. Um, and yeah, it was just a, a lovely virtual piece that is, to be fair, quite, uh, quite good on mobile and tablet, but a bit more difficult on uh, the computer. But it was a really interesting thing. And I think Francesco will share the link to that for you guys if you want to check it out um, in the description. There's, a, there's a, a Spanish photographer called Alex Franco, and if mm -hmm. you get a chance, check out his website. He's a sort of fashion beauty photographer, but he's also very involved in um, sort of youth subcultures in the African continent. And he, his whole website is very much about, you know, there's this interspersion. It's a very living kind of organic uh, website where he's, he's using stills imagery and moving imagery together, and it kind of flows through the site. Mm -hmm. And you can, and it, you know, and it maps very much like that foam um, platform and and there's, so there's there's other people other than him obviously but with Alex Franco he did it he was an early sort of um, uh, he'd take up of, of that way of working and looking at a visual portfolio rather than just quite static kind of series one series two series three etc he was really trying to create this sort of living moving you know content within the aspects of a website you know it was still there to promote his services mm -hmm. and, and show the work that he was doing um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting to see how image makers are, are utilizing that into their, their business model and their sort of social media and, and their web presence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think the very interesting thing about that, that gallery in particular was the, which I didn't play because I didn't want to get the reverb through everyone's microphones, but you can have the uh, narration of the artist talking to you as you look through the work. And then there's a whole mix of video and imagery and also graphic design that bring together a very interesting virtual space. And 
maybe it's something that's more difficult to do in a physical one. I don't know. But uh, as Joe and Jackie were saying, I suppose you can combine with virtual reality or augmented reality um, that within your own, own gallery space. Um, another thing that um, it makes me think about is that you know, um, because uh, with these online exhibitions, they're they're sort of these, you know, are they are they more now? Um, does it take away from the value of photography? There's so much free uh, work that you can see, and they're almost only getting exposure in return for showing their work. But I suppose the virtual world world has become a lot like that. Um, it's almost decentralizing um, these physical locations into a virtual world, which can be viewed by anyone. Um, and and yeah, I don't know how you how you guys feel about that as a as a kind of um, virtual space versus the physical space. Well, I suppose um, I mean you touched on it slightly there. I, I, again, it, it comes down to the scale and the appreciation of the actual artwork. Um, and I think if I'm going to share another link because I think yeah, it, it, I'm going to try and share it a bit later on in the talk, but I think it's it's quite um, pertinent to to share now. <laughs> One second. Uh, right, so this was an exhibition we did. Um, when was it? Oh. Uh, October 2019. 2019. So it was of, um, well, Jackie, do you want to talk about the. Um, oh, well, this the is an artist called Matteo Zamagni. And uh, we. We knew we well. We, we've known on, of him for a while and been working with him for a while. And he proposed doing um, this exhibition. Well, it started off with a film, which you can see on the projector screen there. But then he proposed doing these um, two and a half meter square prints. Um, they were all backlit. Yeah. Um, so it suddenly became a, a whole new sort of. Uh, well, it wasn't going to fit in our little warehouse. Um, the warehouse Incess. gallery and Chatham, that was for sure. So we had to rethink quite drastically where we were going to do this. Um, but, you know, this is a prime example of how, yeah, okay, the 360 images look lovely and it looks nice and you can appreciate the artwork, but, you know, to be in the space when those, when you were confronted by these two and a half metre high artworks and then you have this incredibly frantic video playing on a massive projector with very with intense, very intense music. loud music. Um, yeah. the, the atmosphere is incredible. And then you fill the room up and suddenly it's, it's quite a spectacular thing to be at. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And then what was I mean, your point? My, my point was <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've recorded this uh, as a 360 tour. Um, so you can wander around it and, you know, you, you can, you can zoom right in and you can begin to get a sense of how much detail there is in his, but, you know, that, that is two and a half meters high and the detail of it is incredibly sharp and it's all backlit and it just doesn't do it justice at all. And I think that's the part of the thing, you know, it's, um, uh, you miss all that and the being in inside a space that is, no. It was the, the quality of the, the, the imagination mm. behind the printing and the, and the framing and the backlighting and then the atmosphere and that's what made. Yeah, and then having a the exhibition. Sort of five meter screen of the, the video playing on loop um, mm -hmm. incredibly loud in this 300 square meters of space that's just a big void. And, you know, you, you're never going to get that online. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, it's um... there's, there's sort of that materiality that you you really see in the print and the very fine details. And I also think of the virtual world sometimes can appear quite flat, even when you have that three dimensional image. You're still looking at it from a camera's perspective, and inherently it is a a flat dimension that you experience it in, unless you sort of build an entire entire world. But there's still I I feel like there's a disconnect between um, being in a virtual world and seeing the artwork and actually being in, a, in the gallery and actually physically looking at the work and, it, and looking at the print quality and the, the materials that were used and, and, and it, it almost become every part of it is a, is a bit of art in itself, the framing, the, the print, and I suppose Steve can definitely tell us. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that I, I think we also really imagine we go to an exhibition to look at art, but I think it's more than that. There's so many things that work on the subco subconscious level as well. 
it's the experience of you know walking through that door and and and, and sort of experiencing something for the first time meeting people you know or strangers you don't and getting to know them the sounds the smells the it's all of those things that combine. And I'll share my screen again and show you some examples because I've got a kind of progression of going from very, I suppose, linear sort of two-dimensional objects on walls to this idea of notion of immersion of space. And I think that for all the value of VR and things like that, when you are in the space and there's a physicality, you can feel quite vulnerable, but mm -hmm. also quite empowering. And we've seen a huge um, shift in terms of materiality and what's being used. So I'll just... Um, Go back to my PDF and bear with me while I sort of flick through. Yeah, no worries. Um, so I'll go back to slideshow so you can sort of see the images. But uh, so this was an exhibition uh, of, it's actually of my work that I did a solo at Photo London uh, a few years back with Black Box Projects. And it's an, uh, I suppose it's an indicator of a very traditional way of um, exhibiting photography. Um, these are gicle prints uh, framed and glazed with non-reflective glass because we know that the lighting at Photo London is absolutely atrocious. Um, mm -hmm. And so we had to sort of take a, a sort of safe bet. But it's a, a quite a traditional way of, you know, viewing photography or viewing art uh, on a white gallery wall. Um, we did want to paint the walls a duck egg powder blue, but we would have had to pay an extraordinary amount of money both to do it or have it done and also to have it put back to white wall. So um, we decided not to go ahead with that. But that's a traditional way of maybe looking at, and then this is the majority of the work that we produce is actually done in this way, either as C-type prints, black and white silver gelatin prints, um, or gicle prints. And we can print at Metro, and we're one of the only labs in the UK actually that can print up to 10 foot by six foot uh, on photographic papers. Um, this is Get Up Stand Up. I don't know if anybody experienced that at Somerset House. They took over the whole kind of south and uh, east wings uh, of Somerset House. And it was a, a very, very interesting experiment in terms of the use of two-dimensional object printed matter, but also uh, a, a, a revaluing of the space or evaluation of the space and the way that they did things. So when you entered the sort of the doorway into the exhibition, you felt like you were going into another realm effectively and we're seeing this use of imagery um, and the use of space uh, becoming very important uh, in terms of the context of the work and, and also the design you know aspect of things like that so there's a lot more consideration of space uh, particularly in a space like Somerset House which is normally pretty traditional um, I'd hate to see the repainting bill for that exhibition but <laughs> <laughs> um, this is by Felicity Hammond. Now, Felicity Hammond was um, uh, an RCA graduate that we were mentoring uh, when she graduated uh, through our mentorship program. And she's very interested in materiality, but not only that, she's also very interested in the sort of fantasy of photography and the fa fantasy of exhibition. So understanding where reality ends and where fantasy sort of begins and blurring the edges. So she uses a lot of acrylics vinyls uh, and different sort of plastics to print on um, and, uh, and she's, she's really exploring you know the, the 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 use of space in a different in, in different ways similarly zoe sim um, is a recent graduate well, from a few years ago now a lot of her work is exhibited uh, these are um, low tack adhesive vinyls so there the work is exhibited but she then sells limited edition um, archival gicle prints of the work in conjunction with the exhibition. So there's two kind of pathways in her practice, one of which is this use of space uh, to, to immerse yourself and, and utilize and, and experience her work, but at the same time in terms of its collectability or affordability and, and also um, making it user friendly, she, she, she invites you to, to purchase her work or she sells her work as limited edition prints in this kind of way. We also use light boxes. So light boxes are a new relative LED light panels. It's something that if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I'd say that's a display graphics. The technology comes from bus shelters and now it's being utilized um, in, in the art world. And that's what you find when you work in a lab is that you see lots of cross pollination, different disciplines coming together, together different uh, aspects of print production. 
we have a we have a direct to media printing device now which we've had for several years and it will print on any material up to four inches thick by 10 foot by eight foot and it's an archival inkjet process that can be utilized outside as well so we print on wood bricks leather materials textiles glass you, you know whatever it is we, we, we we're utilizing that and so artists are using these different things in different ways and for me as a as a as a printer and as somebody who works and is obsessed with process, uh, I think it's a fascinating, um, you know, we, we live in times where we're no longer tied to the dark room. Uh, so our imagination can run wild, both in terms of materiality, but also in, 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 in terms of our scale as well and what we can use and, mm. and how we interact with it. And that's where I see, you know, where we are going with the exhibitions. Yeah, the, definitely. In the, you can see in the physicality of the work there, especially in like Felicity Hammond's work. It's very beautiful that it's almost sort of, you know, it's coming into the, the real life space, the 3D space. Mm. It, it's sculptural. A lot of this work is almost becoming sculptural. And I think that's definitely an evolution that we're seeing in photography and the experimentation that people are taking. It's really cool to see that you guys are, are, are printing on those materials as well. And you can print on any material. I really I find that really fascinating. The weird it? thing is, though, I still like going into the dark room and printing a 10-8 black and white print. <laughs> 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 That's far from photography, though. If you're a photographer, you're always going to love that. Um, but I, like I, a pinhole camera, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but, I mean, as well, I mean, that comes back to, you know, you um, speaking about... Um, the reproducibility of work and mm. taking these 3D sort of almost, they're almost becoming sculptural and then being able to, you know, sell them as an artist um, on, on a sort of mass level to more people in, a, in an edition of printing. Mm. And I think that that's a, a really important thing for an artist to be able to make a living from. And it's something that obviously is inherent in photography and making a living. So um, yeah, I mean, how do you find people uh, with, with uh, work with their limited editions at, at Metro? Is that well? We eighty percent of our business is on-demand edition printing, um, and on and offline. So we have several clients, many clients who'll come into the lab and they love that experience of working with a printer and exploring different sort of areas of their practice. Whereas others, um, and I don't think we take it personally. Well, most of us don't don't want to see us and don't want to come to the lab. So they utilize our online services and we also work with a variety of collectives uh, like high noon uh, dark light and we've just got um, i don't know if you've heard of the land art collective uh, yeah yeah i have yeah and uh, and what they do they, they they use us as a kind of bureau for their artists uh, and, and they they manage their editions and they manage their sales and then when those sales are made we run the production for them and we ship to their clients and we use their branded material, et cetera, like that. So edition printing is a major part of what we do. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what's, you know, my advice, I, I always get asked about edition printing and it'd be great to, you know, for Joe and Jacqueline to sort of jump in on this as well about what is important when in edition printing. And what we, we see and hear time again is provenance, authenticity and, um, and, and, and integrity in your work. So we always, the, the advice is a lot of our clients will, they will print a body of work um, consistently with the same material. It may be C-type, it may be G-clay, it may be whatever the media is. They will consistently sell their editions at set sizes and, uh, and a run of edition as well. So that kind of falls in and out of vogue. There used to be, you know, in the early days of edition printing where we would print for Terry O'Neill or, or somebody like that, we'd be doing an edition run of 250. The, more, the likelihood now is that we're doing short edition runs of maybe 10, 15 um, and, and running down. I mean, I myself, I print sometimes an edition of three and you may hear a term as well called an, an AP, an artist's proof or a PP, printer's proof. So you may hear of this terminology as an edition of 10 with one AP. Um, mm. And we've stolen that kind of vocabulary and that language from the printing press, you know, yeah. from the from the the, the, the printers um, in the printmaking studio. Um, so you know, we're, editions are quite low. What's really really important is to, if an edition runs out, do not be tempted to change the size of it and print it at a different size. I think you're running into a kind of slow motion car crash or something like that because what it starts doing is it devalues your practice 
I've sat in, a, in, a, in, a, in an auction at Christie's and uh, an award came up and it was what, edition five of 10. And the guy sat next to me going, I'm here because I've also got edition five of 10. And I saw it in the catalogue. Wow. And he stood up and he made this claim. They had to shut the whole auction. Oh my God. Because it called into question the integrity of that mm. photographer's work. Yeah, so don't be tempted to do that. If the edition runs out, well done. You've made your money from it. Move on and do something else. So, But it's about the integrity of the work. Also, I recommend when you sign your work, always sign it in the same place. Is it on the verso or recto? You know, Do you have a stamp? Do you emboss it? So be consistent. I think that's the key. Be consistent in the way that your work can be identified as provenanced as your work and it's authentic. And I, with students in particular, we sort of get them to sort of get into a way of working where the process in a way is complementary to their style of work. And it kind of helps define and inform who they are as an artist, rather than sort of, you know, for instance, Fuji have over 75 different inkjet papers. I have absolutely, I don't know why. Mm. Um, but you see people just testing, 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 trying out different things, trying to think. Find a way that works for you Use a media that complements your practice, that mm. brings a context or brings something to your work, and don't and, and, and find a way of working like that. But don't be tempted to then jump ship and go and try something completely different. Fair enough. Yeah, that's a good point. I think um, Joe and Jackie, would you like to jump in about like editions and maybe the rarity of work and and having those uh, you know limited editions, how they can add value to the work, especially in the uh, the art gallery, you know, a one-off piece or, or something along those lines. I don't take that one. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, when you exhibit work in a gallery, I mean, I think there is a huge thing about that um, significance of that and um, obviously uh, highlighting the rarity of a piece of work, it, it, it does increase its value and it increases the um, Kind of highlights the uh, expertise of the of the artist as well, um, but that isn't to say that editions aren't a great thing, you know. But do them right, do them carefully, do them properly, as Steve was saying. Exactly. And um, Joe and I were just earlier having a conversation about the signature, you know. I mean, photography. I think, you know, with an with an artist, with a um, a painter or a drawing or something, you know. The signature is always key to that piece of artwork, whereas with photography, it seems a lot harder to figure out where or how to do that signature. But I do think it's really important to, to get it on there somehow and to not disrupt the, 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 the photograph itself, but to actually I mean, we, it, it, we, it adds to the provenance. It That's does, thing, it does. You know? And I think, you know, we, you take an artwork a lot more seriously with that signature on it and that provenance and that history and that uh, knowledge mm. that it's come from, you know, it's not just another print runoff of your printer at home or something, you know, it's sort of, mm. it has to have that, um, and, and also being printed from a reputable print company, you know, yeah. as well, mm. like yeah. Metro. I think as well, I mean, there's a question come up about this is sort of feels more ge geared towards fine art uh, exhibiting and things. I think from a commercial perspective, we work with commercial clients and in Lausanne and you know Switzerland and, and in America and Mexico, but also it doesn't matter where they are, but we work with sort of corporate clients who invest in in in, in art, uh, be it photography or, or other sort of disciplines. And I would treat the same way. I mean, uh, I've seen a lot of photographers pick up additional work by hosting a mini exhibition at a client's um, offices um, at their HQ. We're currently doing a, a quite a substantial um, body of work in collaboration with the National Portrait Gallery, which is shot for a refit. And it's a very commercially aligned body of work with a commercial client. And the view is not just to showcase the work and what the National Portrait Gallery does, but it's also to identify the role of the image maker and to celebrate that. And that is being taken on by the brand and they will utilize the imagery and, and, and who knows, you know, commission other work as well. Um, you know, through that exposure. So it's not just about, you know, in a gallery setting that, you know, from a fine art context, mm -hmm. I, I would take the view that, you know, if you're a commercial photographer, talk to your clients, um, you know, 
if they're commissioning you to do the work, maybe there's an opportunity for you to showcase the work for their employees. You know, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, commercial and corporate companies who are giving back to their employees in terms of their well-being and their, you know, in terms of their employee sort of surroundings and environment. So have that discussion. Don't feel that this is something that you're providing by way of a brief and a, and a commercial. I did a, I used to work as a big industrial advertising photographer and I used to work a lot on, in, on oil rigs. And I was always forever going in and out of offices and you know, putting works on the walls in the boardrooms and things like that of the work that I'd done for a commercial job. And I was like double money because I was then selling on into the same mm. company, Absolutely. the actual imagery. So don't feel it as a, you're as a one dimensional route. Think outside a little bit. Yeah. Who knows what may be able to happen? Well, I think, you know, from a photographer's perspective, uh, that um, a lot of, uh, of um, uh, people I've seen lately have been setting up their own print stores. And I think that's quite an important part of now. Um, and, and I suppose it, it also um, uh, speaks of the relevance of still of the physical piece of art that we're trying to sell, even if it's not fine art, if it's commercial art from our, from our own stores. Uh, and um, I suppose uh, thinking about that, we, we're sort of saying like, how, do you, how should you price your work um, depending upon the gallery or, or the print store or the commercial you know, commercial sale to one of your clients. Um, well, I you know, think editions, editions does take, would, would sort of um, impact on that in a way, if a work is unique, um, then obviously there's going to be an impact on, uh, you know, the value of that work or the perceived value of that work. Um, it, it, they do say, you know, a, a piece of art is only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I do think if you have low editions, then, you know, you are representing the work more uniquely. Um, but I think, you know, and I think that's why we're sort of steering away from these large edition sizes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Joe and Jacqueline, you probably have a better steer on, on the sort of pricing of things. But one thing, one thing I would say is um, we often encounter artists who are producing work and they've actually not added up the cost of production or their time. Um, you know, there's some sort of way effectively fixed costs in making the work. Um, and so, you know, you have to really sort of be pragmatic about what the, the, what the material cost will be mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, effectively time to do this, but also the, the cost of actually the production um, in making the work. So it could be like shooting the film, it could be processing it, scanning film. Um, it, it could be, you know, the time to get retouched on, obviously the cost of the print, framing etc 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 so do yeah. bear that in mind when you're looking at the value of your work or the pricing of your work but i think joe joe and jacqueline i think if you want to sort of come in on that because i think you know it'd be great to hear from a sort of your perspective of what, what you would advise well it's always a really we get asked this a lot and it's a very, <laughs> that's um, why i'm dodging the bullet yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, <Steve. laughs> um it's an incredibly hard one to answer uh, how do you put value on something like this and how, how do we value our own work? It, it's, it, it's so hard. Um, and it, it's, when we get asked for that as um, from artists, it's difficult to give advice without, um, without worrying that you're going to upset someone. Um, and I guess it, it's, it's trying to work out where the market is. Um, understand your market, understand who might be interested in buying this. Um, but also then, again, going back to the edition numbers, um, I guess from an artist's point of view, uh, ask yourself, how many individual pieces do I want to do of this? Um, and I think you're right. Uh, stick to, I, I'd much rather stick to one or two different sizes of a, of a print um, and make that the fixed edition. Don't then, like you said earlier, honestly, don't ever be tempted to, reissue a new set at a slightly different size. Um, so I think try and work that out from the, from the outset and, um, and settle on, you know, if you want this to be an addition of 10, it's gonna be an addition of 10. It's gonna be an addition of 10 at that size and that size and then that's it. And then, you know, we're all creatives. We want to keep on making new work. So move mm -hmm. on to the next one and um, you know, pat yourself on the back if that, that whole uh, edition is sold out and move on. 
Um, but, but just know where you want to place yourself within the market, within the, you know, it, it, you can, you, you know, your work is the value as you see it. If you see it as very high value, place it at a high value, you yeah. know, put yourself up there, put yourself out there at that value. And mm. that's, that's saying something about you and it's saying something about how you see your work, which is very important. I think it's really valuable to understand your audience, whether you're a commercial you know, photographer, designer, creative, or whether you were in the fine art market, it's actually a material. I think it's in, on our uh, mentorship program, one of the core pillars is that we work on is understanding, identifying and working with your audience and maintaining that ability to network and your commitment to community and actually managing that audience. And because they become your ambassadors and they help you grow. They're also your you know, they'll be your biggest champions, but at the same time, they'll be your, hopefully your biggest critics. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, bringing yourself into the market is identifying where, like you, like you say, is identifying where that market is and how you access it and at what point. And, and look around you, look at your peers, look at what others are doing. If you're a commercial photographer, you're, you're often having to pitch for a job at a commercial rate. You know, think of it from the perspective of that. You have, you're, you're, you're adapting and adjusting your portfolio to suit your client's need. You know, when you're, you're, your work goes in for a commission, if you're entering a competition or you're going for a residency, it's all the same thing. You're, you're molding and adapting your presence and your profile to enable you to give you the best chance of getting that gig. And it's the same if you're a fine artist and you're looking to get representation from a gallery. There's no point if you're a street or a documentary photographer trying to go and aim yourself at a fine art gallery because you don't, they don't speak that language and nor do their clients. So identify your targets and identify your route into that target. So it's about a bit of detective work and looking outwardly. And that will also help you evaluate cost you know, to, to, in terms of what you're doing, but also help you assess the value of your work and where it would be pitched at, you know, very much in the way if you were, if you're, if you are a commercial photographer, you know, your rate card uh, mm -hmm. is determined by the competition and by the budget as well. So think, you know, you've got to think tactically about it. So it's about a lot of it. It's about doing your research and understanding your market, understanding, because, you know, uh, um, from our own perspectives, photographers, we, you know, often you assume uh, uh, maybe who your audience may be or where there may be the potential to sell your work. So I think, you know, maybe seeking advice from someone um, such as yourselves is always, you know, a good move um, if, you're, if you're a photographer looking to uh, try and, and sell uh, their artwork. Um, but yeah, I think, it, you know, coming back to that point about, you um, the cost of production, you know, a very valuable lesson you learn when you find out how much, you know, the art glass or the framing is for the for the piece of work, yeah. the larger it gets, you know. And when you look at your the value of your print, and if you know you're selling it for a very low price, you may want to consider that the parts, you know, just the printing, the framing, the shipping, the production costs may actually be higher than that value of the value what you're but that's where you've got to that's where you have to then bring in worth mm -hmm. we have a we 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 make our clients carry a triple a battery around with them for a bit to make them think about who they are it sounds a bit weird but the triple a stands for <laughs> artist advocate and ambassador and they need to understand at what point they're one of the three things because all the time they're all of them Right. Um, and, and, and I think often when you when you when the advocacy comes in is when if you're looking to, I don't know, get on or get into a gallery or get into an art fair or sell your work or get a commission in terms of a commercial commission or something like that, you mm -hmm. may take a hit on the value of that job because it's you see the worth in the long term of developing a relationship or a partnership or identifying an audience and getting away. And that's where advocacy becomes really, really important. You know, and once you get your foot in the door, that's where you become the ambassador or the badge on the front of the car and you start selling your, your wares. Um, so it's, it's worth sort of thinking about that value versus worth um, in, in terms of your practice. No, I suppose on that point of um, building a relationship, I'd put that forward to Joan Jackie about having a relationship with a gallery and, and what value, you know, that can bring to a photographer or an artist. Um, yeah, it'd be good to hear from you guys um about that well i guess um on, on the pricing it, it's really 
good to start developing that that relationship because uh, as gallerists, you can say you can give feedback to the artist directly and um, say you know people are coming in and they they look at it and they're really keen and then they look at the value and the price and they. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. flip or, side, people come in, they look at it and they go, oh, I really like that. How much is it? And they get, and then you tell them the price and they go, Oh, great. Yeah, I'll have that. And then you think, Oh, okay, we pitched that a little bit too low. Mm -hmm. um, so it is this continuous feedback between the, um, to, from the gallery to the artist to say, You know, look, at, at this price, they're, 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 they're either selling too much or they're not selling enough. And I think over time when you start developing a relationship with an artist uh, that becomes a lot clearer and you you can then start to develop together uh, a, 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 a kind of a more a more robust pricing model i suppose um but it, it's difficult though because as soon as um it, for, for artists that are more widely recognized it's easier um, but for, for newer artists, it's, it's hard to do. And um, I mean, we, we, we used to do, we used to champion a lot of um, student shows. And it's interesting that um, Felicity Hammond's name came up because she was one of our, uh, one of the people that we selected for one of our early student shows many years ago, um, because we saw her work as amazing. And um, it's great. It's funny to hear her name again, Steve, actually. It's good yeah, point. I mean, I met Felicity, she was, um she was struggling a bit i think at the royal college and, and i think she was not with her practice or her own direction i think it was sort of where it where it could be placed i think and and how people interact with it because it was so diverse from anything that anybody else was doing at that time yeah and, and um, scale, her scale the scale of her work was massive mm -hmm. and, so yeah. we worked really hard with her in, de in, in terms of identifying the right audience for her yeah. uh, and, and really pushed her um, win a Lumen Prize. Um, yeah. And she's done incredibly well. And I think she's sort of found her people in a way, you know, so it's great, you know, it's just great that you supported her in that way, because I think there was a period when she was kind of thinking of giving up and, and, and um, you know, and I'm sort of delighted that she sort of got to where she is and, and where she continues to grow as well. But and, uh, I, I think that the, the gallery can, you know, sort of offer that same sort of support mm -hmm. that Steve offers his clients is that you know we we do we always become friends with the artists that we exhibit and we we get to know them and then I think there is you know we know how to show their work when to show their work who to introduce them to and you know I've been vaguely looking at the comments and there's so much about that sort of interaction of people in a gallery space and meeting people and um, contacts and that sort of thing and you know you'd hope that as a gallery that's what you also offer to mm. people um, is that opportunity to meet people and the gallery hopefully should be bringing those people to you as an artist to yeah. meet in their space you know and, yeah. that's... and although this this evening is wonderful yeah. and, but you know you look at this there's 70 people in line and um, there's lots of names you recognize and you think if this was in a physical space, so it'd, be it'd, be, it'd be an amazing <laughs> evening. It'd be great. Yes. I can a riot. Really, they would know who and are oh, lovely. Um, but, you know. And we probably have like 10 exhibitions. <laughs> we'll be drunk on cheap white wine. Uh, <laughs> oh, perfect. That sounds ideal. And, and I think that is a very good point about building a relationship and building rapport and letting people know who you are as an artist and and developing that understanding, which I, I feel like a, a gallery can do quite well, is to sort of inform the clients that, who are buying the work, um, you know, what the artist is about and, and, and why their work is, is there in the first place. Um, and I think even in, if you take it to uh, the perspective of a, a photographer selling in their own um, store, you know, ways of, as we saw through like the foam uh, virtual space and, and maybe the, some of the virtual exhibitions, you know, if there are ways of developing that rapport and, and that relationship with your clientele in, and even if it's, a, as Steve said, a commercial client, um, you know, you have a very, you hopefully have a good relationship with that person and therefore they will be much more likely to buy from you because of that relationship and understanding of your, your art. I think um, 
you know, there's a bit of a misnomer about what labs do. I think we think oh, labs just sort of make prints or process film. Um, labs have always been very um, vibrant social spaces for sharing ideas and, and, and a kind of um, incidental learning. You know, you may be coming into lab to do one thing and then you'll overhear somebody talking about something else or you'll see something over the shoulder of something else or somebody else or something like that and, and it's a very much a bit of an, in, an interaction and we've learned over the years that it's not just a sort of zapping barcodes and and making products it's about collaboration so we always start with questions you know when we're meeting new clients there's like you know where do you want to go with this what do you want to do and so you know, out of that, we developed a mentorship program in 2005. We don't have to do it. We fund it. Um, mm -hmm. But we learn a huge amount from it. Uh, so we're always learning as well. And it is a collaborative approach to, to production. All, most of the people, I would say some of the grumpy old gits, uh, I wouldn't include in this, but most of them are very experienced people who are passionate about what they do, myself included. Mm -hmm. And I'm with that passion. I just love hearing other people's stories or, or, you know, trying to imagine it is what, how they want to make their vision real and how we can help them along the way. So we're always hungry for that kind of information. So the, the issue that we have often is that technology moves very rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, and the art world and, 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 and no disrespect, Joe and Jackie is, is, is often, it's, it's quite conservative it's an approach of what's acceptable and, and what people do and so there's all these things coming on stream some of which are a complete catastrophe and will never take off and never work others which um are are, are gold dust and are, are, are incredible i invented a black and white silver gelatin paper uh, mm. in 2004 which was the world's first hybrid so silver gelatin paper that could be it's, it's um, receptive to laser technology Mm -hmm. um, and that is now an industry standard. At the moment, we're working with a Japanese company called Awagami Factory to develop organic and sustainable paper product using byproducts such as bamboo waste, hemp, uh, pineapple. And so we're working on a platform to try and bring these products to market. And they're beautiful products, seasonally made, handcrafted papers for gicle printing, double coated, so you can make, you can print them for books, you can do all this sort of stuff. So we're at that kind of cutting edge, and and so clients, new and old, uh, familiar and unfamiliar, are always asking, "What's happening here? What's happening here? What can I do? What can I do? And how, you know, and how do we make it happen?" We have others who come in and are only interested in scanning. Yeah, yeah. So it's and so they come in and they scan their film and off they go. And absolutely. they want to know more about scanning. They're not interested in us printing anything because they can do it <laughs> themselves. Yeah. And that's absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, I think on that on that point of building relationships, we should ask um, some of the audience um, if they'd like to ask any questions. I know Francesco has been collecting a few and I know you guys have been checking out the chat, but I think it would be good to take some questions um, to Steve, Joe and Jackie. Yeah, uh, so I'm back. Uh, hope this, I mean, for me, it's been very interesting. Hope it's been the same for everyone in the chat. I see that very few people left, so uh, I would assume so. Um, so I've got yeah a list of questions I collected, and I apologize in advance because jumping between the talk and the chat, I, I probably missed some bits. So I tell me if I'm repeating yeah, that's fine. questions. Um, so we start with Felix, who asked at the beginning of the of the of the talk, uh, any advice for early career photographers who may have tight budgets who are looking to sell prints within an organization such as the Artist Support Pledge. Um, for the ones who never heard of it, it's a thing that started on Instagram, I think, mm -hmm. an hashtag, and then spread like crazy at the beginning of the pandemic, and a lot of photographers used it to to sell their prints and. Yeah, so if you look at it online, you'll find it. But yeah, what's, what's the, the advice for early career photographers who are tight on budget and want to, to start with it? I think from a perspective of printing, um, I would look at actually doing as much of the work yourself in terms of prepping your files, setting them up, setting the resolution, all of those kind of things. If you can learn to do those things, it also helps you learn about scale uh, and it, it always informs your practice. So that's uh, a way of 
an economical way of not having to rely on a lab like us to do that work for you because it's not rocket science it just takes mm -hmm. a little bit of time to learn um and if you can do that we offer an online printing service uh, self-service um where you can upload and use us effectively as a, a an extended bureau we will always check your prints and we will always sort of if there's any queries or any questions get in touch with you um so if, if you can do that as much yourself then obviously that's going to save you money uh, the time that you put in will be in the prep you know in terms of you, how you set the files up but i also think it, it, it teaches you discipline in terms of archiving your work as well so down to how you name your files how you store them that kind of thing in terms of your series um and it helps with your sort of housekeeping but that would be a place to start felix i think you know, from a production side of it what i would say is don't skimp on product um you know i would go for archival product if you can you know where you can ultimately you, you want your your work that you sell to have longevity and to be to have a provenance in terms of its archival stability so don't scrimp on the on the sort of that, the products that way um and and i think ask questions i think we have an api uh, which is a, a, a sort of bridge between your website and our production site um, and it makes it, uh, and it's 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 free to bolt on, and you can you can upload your files into a gallery on your site, and and people can purchase directly from your site, uh, and and produced through a lab like ours. Now, there's other labs around that will do exactly the same thing. I'm not saying that we're unique in any kind of way, but it is worth investigating, doing a bit of detective work to see what's out there, and that should, in terms of the production, at the beginning, um, help you save money. The other way is obviously if you're an analog photographer and you could get access to a dark room, whether it's color or black and white, you can rent a space. There's loads of dark rooms when we get back out of lockdown that would be only too eager to help. You know, Photofusion's one that we work very closely with in terms of the photography community. Um, so, you know, you could rent a space, you could go into the dark room, you could print, you know, you bring your own paper, they supply the chemistry. Um, there's lots of different places available to you. That way, you're learning about your practice. It's very craft orientated. Nothing wrong with that at all. I celebrate it. I, I did the artist support pledge myself, and I did all the printing myself in my own darkroom. It was black and white, um, and uh, you know. And so, you know, you, there's, there, there are different ways of doing it. In essence, do as much of what you can yourself in the beginning. Mm. And and Joe and Jackie, I, I, from a sort of more exhibition space fine art if you were just starting out what what would be the well, advice i think it's all about um trying to get your your name out as much as you possibly can so as many of these things that you can get involved with then do and um you know offering your work at, at, a, at a at a much reduced rate is fantastic because people want to buy your work and giving people the opportunity to do that who might not necessarily be able to do that anyway is is fantastic and it, it's um it hooks you into different networks of people who are browsing other other work and may then just come across you and and um, images and names stick in people's minds and competitions as well. Yeah, competitions are fantastic. Yeah, yeah, get as involved. Then as you've got the can. support. Then suddenly you have the support of a huge network promoting you and putting your name out there. Yeah, especially if you win. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Always helpful. Uh, yeah, I, I would say I did the artist support page and I, I sold all the prints that I made, but to nobody I knew. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of blindsided by my audience. It was a completely new audience because I'd sort of put it out on things like Facebook, which I'd never done before, because mm -hmm. I'm always restricted by putting things through my gallery. Um, and it was the first time I'd sort of really encountered that. So it was quite refreshing in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually, you know, it's very grounding in essence as well. But and so, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a very worthwhile you know, opportunity for you to explore that. And I agree with Jackie about competitions, you know, participate in the community uh, of the creative industries by way of competition, open submissions, uh, things like that. Um, if you look at PhotoWorks website, they are very hot on, um, um, call call for entries and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, just open calls. It doesn't have to be a competition element. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Instagram's a great one as well. There's loads of zines out there who are doing yeah. open call submissions. There's a few at the moment. I forget who they are, but there's a few sort of um, open submission call outs that are on Instagram. So yeah. you know, look at zines. Look at any opportunity to sort of um, 
for other people to access your work. Yeah, and other small publishers, exactly like you say. Another great avenue to look would probably be through a portfolio review, maybe mm-hmm. with either a photographer you really expect, uh, re- no, a photographer you really respect, or a uh, or a publisher. Um, and you never know, there may be someone who can again help you with that relationship to take your personal work and and see you know where it can go from there. So yeah, I do loads of reviews and um, a lot of coaching on 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 review presentation, and that's a whole different talk. So we won't even go there, mm-hmm. no. <laughs> or I won't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's um, and, and let's take another question. Then, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned zines. So we had a question from uh, Felipe. Uh, asking if zines or um, or prints in general, but yeah, uh, I think that zines are an interesting part of the printed products, uh, are still a good, valuable way to present your work. And if it's a printed portfolio, still useful nowadays to promote yourself. I, I'm assuming this comes more from the commercial part of the of photography. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of some recent examples that I may have I would say lying around, <laughs> filed <laughs> yeah. away. Um, I think, um, actually, if you look at what zines are and, and what they've become, I think they, Mark Villet does a brilliant zine, uh, and they're, they're for sale now in the Photographer's Gallery bookshop. Um, but also, there's a great photographer um, who lives up uh, in Yorkshire called Joe Coates, and she creates these wonderful... If you just hang on a second, I'll go and grab one. Yeah, 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 please do. yeah absolutely. You, um, so Joe's, um, Joe yes. produces these uh, documents, uh, oh, yeah. and they're beautifully bound and printed mm-hmm. um, examples of her work, and, and they can become collectible. I think this is number field notes number 21. Uh, and so there's different avenues, you know, in, you know, into people accessing your work. And, and I think that printed matter is, is still an important part of that. <laughs> there you go. Another it's one. Cool. Got... Our zines now. Yeah. So you know, this it's a show and tell, but do you know what I mean. I think um, it, it's it's just looking at it in things in different ways, and you don't have to go into this wholesale hardbound publication. You know, you can actually do something relatively on the fly. There's a great guy as well called Devil's Point, um, Cole Quark, who lives in Brighton. He does an incredible sort of. He's a very sort of. He, he works around the sort of skater community and, and real kind of wide boy sort of um, trash kind of sort of skaters. And uh, they create these beautiful, in, in, incredibly inventive and uh, exciting publications, you know, that become collectible. Um, and zines really came of edge, I think, you know, through the punk era. And I'm old enough to remember uh, that, that sort of era where it became anti-establishment and it became a kind of, you know, two fingers to society. Yeah, zines, in it? some respects, you know, still have that kind of hmm. mentality. You know, and I, I enjoy them. I really like them. I love them. I think Joe had a, a point he wants to make as well. Yeah, no, I think it's just it's another way of cataloging your own work as well. Um, and I think something that forces you into the discipline of, of, of publishing, self-publishing and, you know, whatever value you want to go at, um, it gives you that. Kind of personal rigor to put together and collect and sort of cherish your past work and then um uh, and move on from there yeah yeah absolutely and sticking with you guys i think we've got another question that uh, is more for uh, jack and joe uh dior is asking she's uh she's a um, photography student and she says uh, that they're cu- currently uh, creating their own exhibition uh, a virtual one i guess and they're asking, uh, what software or websites do you find the easiest to create an exhibition slash gallery? Is there any, you know, particular software or? Well, our, our uh, um, online 360 galleries are done using KL, KL Panel, KL Panel. Yeah, software. <laughs> but I think the thing is, you, you need then to have a physical space, space that you can photograph. Um, I mean, we have put uh, fake exhibitions into um, into real spaces, which just takes quite a lot of complicated photoshopping to uh, because everything is stitched together in a 360 degree spherical image. So when you start trying to photoshop things in, you have to then build in all the warping. Um, so I mean that is possible, but uh, in terms of software for putting your work online, I mean there's I don't know whether it's 
I'm not sure whether you're aiming at selling it or exhibiting it. Um, if it's if it's selling, then there's quite a few good sort of sales uh, online sales sites. Well, if it's if you're trying to produce a, an online virtual gallery, I mean there are some amazing ones out there, but they cost a lot of money. That's the trouble. And we've we've you know. Um, What's that one that costs a fortune? Um, uh, Matterport. Matterport, yeah. you know, that, I mean, oh, yeah. they, they look stunning. They look amazing, mm. but they cost a fortune. So and it also has to be photographed within a physical space as well. Um, so we yeah. tried to, to do a workaround, basically. So, mm. you know, we've taken 360 photographs of our gallery space, and then we can insert artwork where we want within that. Um, but it is quite a, a time intensive task, to be fair. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, our collective, we, we worked on it. I mean, if Luke is here, I'd love him to come on and to tell us a little bit more about it. Because he, he spent many hours on uh, Mozilla Hubs, which I'm sure Francesca can share the link to. And yeah, that was yeah. the platform that we use for our... It's way more tech savvy, I think. Well, yeah, yeah it, is a, it is a bit of a tech yeah. savvy... Uh, uh, this one. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, do. Absolutely. This was, this was our... This is our gallery in Chantemps, um, yeah. and there's artwork on the wall, uh, and there's artwork all the way around. Mm -hmm. But this actually, in reality, none of this artwork existed. Well, um, you can tell. <laughs> well, I don't know. Oh, no, I like good use of the drop shadow, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. It was it was done in a bit of a rush, and it was done for um, for open house uh, last year. So, I mean, you, you, can, you can go around to any of these places and you can zoom into the different pieces of artwork. There's bits of information on them. And I think you can even play bits of video. Um, <laughs> probably, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. But uh, so that, that's actually possible. I think we, we put that together in. That's very events, easy using, you know, you know mm -hmm. online. Yeah, but um, you, you need the blank space gallery and then you just yeah. have the time to paste it into every... I, I think that was an approach that we considered as mass, you know, trying to find a space uh, even, you know, um, prior to the lockdown and, 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 and trying to put our print our artwork up. But obviously there's the associated cost with printing the work and, and framing the work. Um, so that's a clever intervention to sort of create a image of the, a physical space in which you have and making the most of that and then inserting maybe digital artwork into that if you're a student or you're trying to make yeah. that work. It, so, it's yeah. quite cheap because I mean um, a lot of the expense of putting on a show if you're uh, if you're if you're if you're an artist putting on a solo show for example is the printing and mm -hmm. uh, I mean people like Steve you're very good at supporting and um uh, sponsorship and, and works like that and I think one of the biggest shows we had was Sacred Geometries which You're was an amazing sponsored um, by your kind of yeah. um, and that was an incredibly popular show and was picked up by the BBC and everything um, so I think that but the, the printing cost is 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 high for the people who are trying to put on exhibitions um, the problem we have is that back in the day we could you know the, the 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 our sort of market was awash with labs and it was awash with product and you could almost you could dictate your own terms and what price you wanted to pay for the work for the product because they were all vi Kodak was vying with Fuji and Ilford mm. with Agfa and it's and Kent Mir and all etc cetera, etc cetera. and now that that side of the market is actually become very streamlined you know Kodak are very sort of off the radar in many respects where you know Ilford are still going Agfa's no longer Kentmere got swallowed by Ilford and all these kind of things and and so the market's kind of monopolized by the manufacturers and, and unfortunately as a byproduct of that is that we we can't pass on the discounts as much mm -hmm. as we could before and you know, and and we we do see often now the the cost of production can often be a barrier to entry for a lot of people. However, I would say that you know, and I, I may be setting myself up for a fall here. Is talk to <clears> us, <throat> talk to us about what your plans are, and we will work out a budget with you. Mm -hmm. um, there may be lots of sharp intakes of breath in the very beginning, but have the conversation. And I think anybody that you partner with, any, any third party that you get involved with, these days just have a conversation about what your aims and objectives are. 
you know, have a clear idea of what you want to achieve. And it's not about negotiating the best deal. It's, a, it's trying to collaborate in a way to, to make a solution because we want to produce exhibitions, both okay. in the physical sense, but we also want to have immersive space. So it's whether the use of audio, we may know somebody, an audio artist, or we may know somebody who's a projectionist or something like that, who's also looking to collaborate in other ways. So it's not about just a straightforward transaction. It's about a trajectory more. Mm -hmm. So, so do get in touch and say, look, I've got an idea. That's where the most exciting things start is with a concept. It's just how far you can take it based on the budget and the time, et cetera, that you have at your disposal. But it's always worth a conversation. Mm. Okay. And on that note, I think we'll uh, maybe ask, have we got any more questions, Francesco? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, it's so two more and then yeah 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 so i would there's a list of questions that i could, I could group in a single one so we've got uh i'm gonna get the the, the pronunciation wrong with this i'm sorry uh as bjorn um that is asking um this is all about you know printing and producing and uh editing uh so related to this topic of scale is it is it common to offer prints in several sizes? I'm curious to hear thoughts on that from the gallery and print art slash art buyer point of view. Felix is asking, really interested uh, to know more about uh, editioning. What is the best way to edition your work for your very first photographic project or series of photographs? And Roseanne is asking, uh, is the, well, this is very specific, is the signature on the reverse and therefore not seen when framed considered okay? So, Many questions. Which yeah, many questions up? all related to how you set up basically your your products that you, okay. you want to sell. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Go, which Jackie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, going back to the different sizes, um, I see Paul Rafter is on here. Hi, Paul. Good to see you. Um, we did a, an awesome exhibition with him, um, uh, Berlin Voids, I think it was called, uh, quite a few years ago. And um, that was an incredibly popular exhibition. I think we even got eight pages in the AJ um, about it. And we had lots of visitors and lots of sales. And I think the way we offered the sales there were, um, there was a, a set, um, I think there's maybe three different sizes yeah, yeah. Um, that they could be printed at. And if anyone, you know, it was print to order basically. Um, but, um, but that was very successful. So. Yeah, I think offering print to order at people's different sizes because certain people want things that, you know, ev everyone's got a wall with a bit of space that they can fit something onto or they should do, or hopefully they still do. Uh, <laughs> well, we the, cl do. the classic yeah. line running at galleries, oh, I love it, but I've, I haven't got I the space. Have space. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. I think um, I'd sort of, I think you've got to be consistent. Um, I, uh, I, I, we, we call it a kind of declaration of intent uh, as a photographer or artist is that when you set out the project and what you're trying to achieve is that you also think about scale, you think about the additions and do not deviate once you've sort of gone down that path. It comes back to, you know, once the edition sells, do not be tempted to start again or a slightly different size. Um, you're kidding nobody. Um, so I think it's, you know, make a kind of, uh, a commitment to yourself really and an understanding of what the work's about. Um, I produce my own work. Sometimes the projects have been some examples of the work 10 foot by six foot. Um, I did a show at the R, I did some work for the RA last year and they were uh, edition of three. Um, actually, I can show you one of them. Mm, that'd be good, yeah. Uh, I think I put it in here. Francesco, what, what was that? You, you hit me with three questions all in one. Very specific one about uh, yeah. signing on the reverse. We spoke about this earlier today, and we, we mm. it was kind of a more of a philosophical question about um, the the medium of print and photography, and mm. why so few photographers feel that they can actually put a pen onto a photographic print and sign it. That's uh, interesting. Not a word. And, you know, I, it, it's more of a kind of an open question to the photographers who probably quite a lot in the audience. Um, do, you feel, do, you, do you feel it's kind of sacrilege to actually write 
and, and to put a different medium on top of that photography. Because um, as, as, as gallerists, um, it's great to see a signature because A, it, it just instantly hits provenance. Um, but also it, it shows that kind of person behind the camera in a way, which is in some ways very important. Mm, absolutely. I mean, I, I'll let Steve uh, talk to us about his, his work, um, but okay. I often do sign on, on the front of the piece itself with a, with a pencil because I just feel like it's an honest uh, representation of myself. And, and uh, I think it's important to show the signature too someone on the work so yeah so this I'll, I'll come to the signature in a minute this this is actually a work that i did there's these are 10 by 8 um, silver gelatin prints that i printed but they were encased in this box which i designed um with the framer uh, and when you buy this artwork it, it comes as a unit like this so and there was an addition of three in each of the in the series but so they're very small prints but they're also very considered approach to how they're presented as well. You can't buy this work or purchase this work without actually buying the frame um, because the frame is integral to the concept and the context of the actual series as well. So there's a, relation, a real strong relationship between this box bound artwork um, and how it's presented. These are signed on the, on the reverse um, and um, what I also do with my work, and I think what, I'm, what I'll, I'll, I'll sort of very briefly say is it's about consistency. Whether you sign your work on the front, uh, whether you sign it on the back, or whether you provide a label. Um, somebody's asked a question about if you sign something on the back and then it's mounted, does that devalue the work? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously you're masking uh, the, the image, you know, you're, you're, you're masking that signature. We do a lot of work with Guy Bourdain's estate and a lot of the works are signed on, on the reverse. And on the frame, we have to con construct a kind of porthole where you view the signature through the back of the, the frame structure. And that's something quite unique in that yeah. way. It shows um, how important that signature really is then. It, it is, it? yeah. But for Terry O'Neill, sadly, who passed away, um, mm -hmm. he used to sign all his work uh, on, the, on the front, bottom right, and the edition number bottom left. And invariably, he'd come into the lab and get it wrong. <laughs> yeah. or he'd smudge his signature or something oh, like that. We'd have to start all over again. What yeah. we do now um, is that we, we print his signature uh, as part of the archival print. It then gets iconic images who own his um, estate. Uh, they stamp it on the reverse with this unique coding uh, stamp. Mm. And if you've heard of an organization which are fascinating called TagSmart, they're incredible. They've created a synthetic DNA and so we're, we are, um, and it's, they create these tiny thumb, like almost fingernail size uh, stamps that go onto the artwork. It was originally designed uh, for very expensive handbags so that they could be um, traced and tracked if they were stolen. Mm. But they've now developed, and for sculpture as well, but they now photographers and artists, so check out TagSmart, it's quite fascinating. Um, the guy that runs this, this they're brainiac scientists, um, and uh, they are incredibly, incredibly clever people. And uh, they've created a synthetic DNA that wow. you can apply. And it doesn't, once it's on, it's on. <laughs> right. It can be, be um, destroying the artwork before you it get can it. Be tra it's traceable. And there's an online wow. a secure server that documents every artwork and its history. Mm. I, that's, that's super interesting. I just put the link, I found it online of this Tugsmart on the, in the chat. I would close the Q&A with the last question from Raquel that I think is quite interesting. We kind of touched this topic and it's this for more, more for Joanne Jackie. And she's asking how uh, the relationship uh, with the gallerist starts. Is it the artist approaching the gallery or you prefer to be yourself finding the artists that you want to represent? Well, we, mm. we work we work both ways, really. Yeah. I mean, um, we love having emails and, and portfolios sent to us to look through. Um, we are very specific, however, in what we show. Yeah. So um, in terms of the photography, it, it, you know, we do have a very, we, we are very keen on keeping the architectural aesthetic going of what we're doing and keeping that 
Um, you, you get approached to quite a lot. People send cold call CVs like they do with anything really. Um, and you get lots of people saying, oh, I've, I've got some really lovely art, but I'm an artist. Um, can I show you my work? And you say, yeah, okay, is it working with an architectural aesthetic? And they say, well, not necessarily, but can I send it you anyway? Mm -hmm. And you say, okay. And it's photographs of dogs or something like that. And but I think definitely, <laughs> definitely send, send but, your work out to people, yeah, yeah, but do. research yeah. research the gallery first, research yeah. what they do mm, and exactly. make sure you're relevant to what they are trying to achieve with their gallery and their, and their um, ethos of what they've created. Um, but we also love finding people and we do yeah. that through Instagram or through um, student shows, student shows, competitions, uh, anything like that. And we, all we really- All manner of different things, don't we? And, yeah, and we're always yeah. on the lookout. So the more someone is out there in the world, then the more likely we are to see them. Um, yeah. But the other thing is, uh, which I, I don't know if it's more what we do or what other people do, but we, like to um, put artists together. So we, mm -hmm. we generally don't do so many solo shows. What we really like to do is bring people together to create a conversation about an exhibition. Um, so I don't know how that helps yeah. you, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe if there's like two or three of you that work together and you have it, you know, then coming to, uh, well, it is actually because yeah. Um, Abnormal, who are, who are a group of four architects that approached us, and they all work together to create um, the, to create artwork together. And actually, bringing the four of them together creates a very strong um, vibe for an exhibition. Yeah, which I'll was, just show you a quick. Um, and this is something I... we supported. We gave them a little a, a budget to put on and. Um, so this was an exhibition. Uh, so actually approaching as a collective is actually quite an interesting idea as well. If you're part of a collective or part of a group to sort of approach in that, in that respect is actually kind of quite interesting. Yeah, so we combined this, we actually took their work and put it all into VR as well. So part of the exhibition was, uh, there was our work on the wall, but there was also mm. our ex exploration of it as well at the same time. Yeah, we're, and, you know, it, don't don't be afraid of um, cold calling people, but no. like Jackie says, make sure you've done your research and you're approaching the right galleries with the right questions, and you you know what they're about before you start knocking on their doors. Great. Okay, and yeah, thank you everyone, and yeah, I would close the Q and A session here. I would like to invite Luca to just jump in and say say hi. Me, Henry, and Luca are the, the core of math, and uh, so we would like to. Yeah, hi guys. <laughs> I don't talk much. I do mostly behind behind the scene work. Well, yeah, great, great talk, and thanks for everyone for uh, for coming. And uh, yeah, I really hope we will all be able to see each other physically. I I talk more when I'm not in front of a a computer screen. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. And yeah, we're really thankful to everyone that's come along today. And um, thank you to our panel so much. Like it's been a really very, very interesting talk from Steve, Joe and Jackie. So thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Um, we really appreciated all the donations um, and you can support our collective through our website as well so that we can put on more of these talks and events. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, um, any final word from Steve, uh, Joe and Jackie? I just want to say thank you for the opportunity and for the invite to take part this evening. I know that um, I, I tend to sort of digress a little bit in places and apologies for that. I just get really sort of uh, into what we're talking about. Um, but yeah, and it's, it's great to hear from the perspective of Jackie and, and Joe um, and also to, you know, to meet some new people as well. Um, I have put my email address. I don't know if that's a good thing. Uh, in the chat box. Um, if you do want further information and genuinely just advice on, on, on any aspect of your practice and, and uh, you know, at this time in particular, I think we've, we've been through hell and back uh, as, as creative industry. So this togetherness and the sense of community is something that we need to sort of really build more than ever. And I look forward to a really, you know, safe, bright spring and summer uh, when we can get together in person um in front of art with a warm glass of wine 
mm. and a VR headset <laughs> and a tablet <laughs> and a blasting audio uh, yeah. and a bloody good time. <laughs> yeah. we, will, uh, we will have physical yeah. socials again. <laughs> I don't really have much more to add to that. Uh, <laughs> to and thank, thank you, Mass, for, for organising all this. And uh, thanks to everyone for attending. And we really hope to see all you guys in person um, at some future event. And keep your eye on an East Dot Gallery. That's us. And, um, you know, there'll, there'll be real things really soon. <laughs> <laughs> we promise. <laughs>